imagination. You are really free and fearless, I think. The only thing I'm really good at is creating magic. People come to me for my imagination. It's weird, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm on fire, and it's like, yeah. do, 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 do. Okay, so <laughs> forget this question. I went to school studying psychology and hypnotherapy. You tell me. <laughs> I could, but I won't. Go, oh my God, that was amazing. I want to do it again. In my world, there's no more fears. So. How to make art in big city like yours? If you want to just create art because it's inside you, then don't listen to this part. People who buy the art have no sensitivity for art. They're afraid of something, go do it. I'd rather die doing what I love than anything else. Looks full, hoping to create a better world. I was so excited after our previous conversation because your thoughts of art and in general about an art is so deep. And I understood that you are an artist from your within, yeah, from your inside. And you just can be an artist and it's like your lifestyle and you just live the art, right? Oh, yeah, that sounds yeah. accurate. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask you, what message do you want people to take away from your art? You know, it's an interesting question. And I feel like I should have a better answer. But like you said before, I'm not an artist for anybody else. I'm artist because I have to be. And this is, it feels like the only thing I can do. There's no deep rooted message for the audience because the audience is always changing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's audience members who see my work at an event. There's audience members who see it in a theater. And, and so, Every perspective is different. The message is always different. I guess if I was to boil it down to something, live passionately, viscerally, and viciously. Mm -hmm. Follow your gut, whatever it is. Don't, you know, don't do things because your parents said you should or society tells you you should because you will eventually find yourself at some point in life with deep regret unless you follow your spirit and your calling and so if there was a message it'd be that oh great you know i wanted to ask you what advice you could you know uh, give for budding artists and for people which may be doubting in themselves uh, who is afraid of create so so probably the answer is like like you said I would be misleading the audience listening if I said doing that will equal success. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it will. I know a lot of artists who are very, very good, very, very talented, and they're not doing very well in their life financially or in their version of success. Mm -hmm. If you're going to decide to be an artist, you're already picking a game where the odds are against you you're going to vegas and you're gambling now mm -hmm. and doesn't matter there's some artists who are extremely talented who who never really make a living and there's some who suck and you know who they are you see their work and their household names and you don't understand why there's a lot of politics behind art too but i'd rather die doing what i love than anything else. I think I could sleep better at night going, if if it, if I wasn't able to make a success of myself, but I was still doing what I love, I think I'd feel better than if I became wealthy selling insurance. Not that there's anything wrong with selling insurance, just for me, it would be hard. Yeah. What I would add though, being an artist requires you to be a better businessman or woman first. Mm -hmm. You must understand who's buying art if you want to you want to make a living if you want to just create art because it's inside you then don't listen to this part if you want to make art your living you need to understand the business of art who's buying art usually it's not other artists so you need to understand the structure of who's buying it why are they buying it why are they buying art versus buying real estate like there's there's a whole bunch of worlds you need to understand 
and figure out a way that you can spill your soul onto a canvas or onto your instrument or whatever it is, but make sure that it's also bought at the same time so you, you can sustain yourself. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Sometimes it's very difficult, you know, to find that uh, boundaries between what you love and what you need to do making money, you know, like, and to combine it together and to create something essential. Do you think you are a successful artist? I, I mean, I, I think that's a tricky question because first, how do we define success? Money? Is it notoriety? Is it self-satisfaction? I mean, there's so many ways of defining success. So I'd rather say, I, who cares? Mm -hmm. I, I can say I'm happy. I love what I do. I'm supporting myself and other people from what I do. So in that sense, yes. Uh -huh. uh, but that's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't okay. know if I'm a successful anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I want to ask you, what's your core value? So making art, maybe as a person, you know, because your art, your art and personality is the same. I always lean back into living lucid dreams. That's the tagline for my artistry. Whatever it is, whether it's films, events, music, I want to throw people into a living lucid dream. I want them to feel like they've stepped into a world where it is a dream, but they can control elements of their dream. So it's not like when you're sleeping and, and things are just happening. I want them to feel like they have an active role in, are they going this way? Are they gonna fly? Are they gonna swim? Are they gonna go into a red room? Whatever it is, they're in control of this new magic arena. So my core value is hold a container of that magic so that people can experience that. And to be honest, I'm not really doing it for people. Mm -hmm. That just happens to be how I make a living. Yeah. And this goes back to your thing before where you said, you know, balancing what you love to do and what you need to do to make money. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. I didn't think I was going to make um, wild, whimsical events mm -hmm. for a living. But that was the place that made the most sense to make a living doing what I do best, right? And so there's a compromise where I go, okay, there's wealthy people who want to spend money on crazy parties, yeah. but the parties that I go to aren't that good. So how, if I take my imagination, what can I do to this party that already has the money there and make it amazing? And then all of a sudden I find myself now doing this thing, right? It's yeah. not what I love to do. It's a marriage between what I love to do and what I need to do. And then I fall in love with that. How to make art in big city like yours? I'll start with saying, create your own signature mm -hmm. so that no matter what when somebody sees a piece they know that it was yours so when i started in the events thing i used to do every kind of event and stuff i won't even talk about in detail but like bar mitzvahs weddings like all things that were just nothing that you know of me yeah but that i had to start somewhere and at some point when I started understanding, okay, this is how this world works. I never knew. So once I figured out the structure, I had to make a decision. I'm not doing any of these anymore. I don't care how much they offer. This isn't happening. And so I started saying no. Now this is counterintuitive because I also was broke. So saying no means I'm having a hard time feeding myself, but I needed to create the signature. So not only was I saying no, I was creating visual scapes. So I'd have my friends come over, I'd make costumes, take pictures of new things. And I created a new price list. Mm -hmm. And I made the price list three times what it used to be. And I just kept saying no, 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 no. Until the no's, all of a sudden you get a yes. And when the yes comes, they're paying the, that amount that fills all those no's. Yeah. So, be there's a balance between like 
being unshakable, mm -hmm. you know, knowing what your signature is and not breaking from it. And every now and then there are times where it makes sense to break from it. But as a general rule of thumb, if you see any party, you can probably guess, okay, that's a Kaya party. The signature is clear. And that signature happens by not doing things for your client. People come to me for my imagination. I don't go to them for their imagination and create their thing. I only want to work with people who say, I love what you do. Here's a check, do it for me. And then you develop a relationship where that starts developing a word of mouth where people are excited about the mystery of, well, we don't know what we're going to get, but we know it's going to be good. Yeah. Now, this is where responsibility comes in. If you're going to do that, you must make sure that not only you do everything you said, but exceed their expectations. So whatever they think you're bringing, bring one and a half times more so that they're just mind blown and develop repeat customers. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is develop, you know, 80% of my business are the same customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, and the more years you're working, the more repeat customers you have that have that trust with you, they're not, you're not dealing with small negotiations where they're nickel and diming. You're like, look, this is what it costs. They don't ask questions. Here, take it. Here, take double. Make me two. Right? Mm -hmm. So how long uh, you are in this industry? 17 years. Oh, 17. Okay. Yeah. I see so you have your base and you have your style you have your signature signature and you know i i want to ask you one question <laughs> it just curious i saw on your instagram uh like your site yeah you have your logo yeah and what what does this site mean <laughs> can you tell me <laughs> i could but i won't I can tell you that it has something to do with pulling magic from the ethers and bringing it into the physical plane. How could you describe your art style, maybe? Fuck me, I don't know. You tell <laughs> me. It's like usually you create something, you know? Um, I see, like, you, you want to trigger people with your art, you know? What? It reminds me well, a little bit of, you know, of circle sometimes, of cabaret sometimes, some, something forbidden maybe, but, but very interesting and, you know, exciting. So I see. You know, it's, it's the same. I follow the laws of seduction with art. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, seduction is something everybody understands. Yeah. And we all want to be seduced. And so playing with mystery, playing with concepts that are slightly familiar so that it's not scary. Why do I play with circus or cabaret or things? Because people go, okay, I'm familiar. I know what that is. And you suck them in a little deeper. And that's when you start triggering them, right? Mm -hmm. And you start creating pattern interrupts where their brain is, is kind of caught off guard. And when they're caught off guard, you, you can now start injecting new patterns into their mode of thinking. I went to school studying psychology and hypnotherapy. So I utilize a lot of those techniques in my work because the brain works in a very predictable fashion. And especially when people have regular jobs, regular routines, their minds work in a pretty repetitive loop. So it's not very hard to throw a wrench in the wheel and, and fuck it up. The only thing is when you do that, where are you fucking it up to? Are you fucking it up just for fun? Or are you doing it to redirect them into something that's really beautiful? And my goal is, yes, I will shake people up, but I will always leave them in a place that makes them go, oh my God, that was amazing. I want to do it again. And it's, it's usually much, I mean, getting there is hard, but the, the messaging is simple. It's about being present, being alive, doing what you love, not being afraid. And most people live their life so afraid of everything, afraid of what their friends will think, afraid of if they're doing the right thing, afraid of if they're going to make it to whatever. There's just fears everywhere. 
in my world, there's no more fears. And if we do create fears, we create fears very heavily just to show them it was fake. Mm -hmm. Right? So if we scare you and scare you and scare you, you're going to find out that the monster was a bunny rabbit. So, so it's, it's, it's a constant reminder to give people their power back. Yeah, that's very cool, you know. Uh, if you could uh, describe, define your art in one word, what word it would be? Mm. Yes, one word. <laughs> or you can't do that, like, in one word. I could try. I, I mean... Uh, you know, you know, my first instinct was to say whimsical, but that's not the truth. Whimsical is a, it's an elusive word. That's me seducing, right? Mm -hmm. The truth of what it is, is it's transformative. Oh, okay. So... But I don't like the word, so. <laughs> Why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't bring you in. Transformative is you know, it's a cognitive and logical understanding where whimsical still has a hook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. You know uh, why I'm asking you that? Uh, because uh, in our previous conversation, you said me that you had, or maybe you still have this um, synesthesia, yes, this syndrome. And I didn't know nothing about this before. <coughs> and when you... Tell me about this. It was like, wow, it's something very special. Like you're a unique one, you know, <laughs> like you can, you can feel and you can like uh, feel, you can feel a lot of emotion at the same time and, and transform it into your art. You know, it's somehow for me, for normal, normal person, it's somehow very mysterious and very even it's somehow very cool if artist has this i don't know how do you feel with it but like you know it's somehow very interesting for me well i i can see how you see it that way and i also see it that way in certain lenses mm -hmm. in the in the sphere of creating art it's a superpower yeah. it's amazing in everyday life and my whole life is not creating art mm -hmm. right i still have to go to the supermarket i still go to the <laughs> bank right like and and i still you know there's there's many circumstances in life where that is a it's a deep hindrance and and it makes me feel insecure because I don't have the ability to communicate always as cleanly as I want to because I'm experiencing all those things. It's like being on an acid trip constantly. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out when it's free. So I like to stay at home most of my life yeah. and just create my work. And I only leave when I'm ready to, to put it out. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't like to go out much. I don't like big crowds. It's kind of ironic because I do big events for a living Right. But if somebody invites me to a party, I'm not going. Yeah. I don't like to be around a lot of people. And I, when I'm throwing it, I have a very clear direction and a reason why I'm there. But just to be there, I don't, I'm don't. i too sensitive and it, and it makes me feel like I need to go home for two days and stay in a dark room. Cool, sometimes. And sometimes it's really not cool. Just like everybody is very unique you said i'm unique so are you so is everybody every flower on this planet is unique every raindrop though they may look the same are completely unique every snowflake looks the same completely unique there's not a single person that's not unique yes. it's the question of are they maximizing their unique qualities to their best interest or are they trying to fit their unique qualities into a societal norm and that makes them no longer unique. How do you think, if not synesthesia, could you be an artist? <laughs> no, I'd probably be a lawyer. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't have, I don't have, um, I know my brain likes certain things. I love studies of psychology, philosophy, hypnosis. I love studying human behavior. So I probably would have gone somewhere in that sphere. 
Um, I also like to argue, so that's why I said lawyer. But artistry is, you know, it's a dangerous world. And, you know, I don't recommend it to anyone unless you, you don't have a choice. If it's something that someone is like hobby passion about, let it be a hobby and, and you're going to enjoy it much more because if you don't have to make a living from it, then it's just art and it's your way of expressing yourself and everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And I recommend everybody find their own art because it's a beautiful form of expression. When you decide, not only am I an artist, but this is going to be what I identify as how I'm going to survive, how I'm going to eat, how I'm going to have a family and support my family. That's a whole nother world. And you have to be a whole nother kind of artist to pull that one off. And I'm still figuring that one out every day. I just, I don't recommend that unless you don't have another option. Mm -hmm. And those who don't have another option already know that. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about your day routine or how how you prepare your your work, your you know your your event, you know, or your daily life. Could you tell me more about this? I love lists. I start every morning. I first a little meditation just to clear whatever dreams I had, just some quiet time for myself. Open a pure ivory white paper, and I just start writing. I write all the things that need to get done technically, all the things that I want to get done, um, random thoughts that I don't know where they're going to land, but for some reason they jumped in my head, so let's just put it here on another one. And every day has its own page. Mm -hmm. And then I start crossing off, and I make sure that I get through that list every single day. Or if there are things that are bigger, then I'll break it down each of those bigger pieces so that I can at least get every piece I can in one day done, which allows me to feel, you know, when you work as an artist, it's hard to sometimes quantify if you're actually getting something done. And so you have to be very self-disciplined to go, all right, I know that's where I'm going. These are the steps. And every day I'm working diligently because there's no boss to tell me there's no time clock. If I don't want to do anything, I don't have to. I can wake yeah. up and do nothing all day. And sometimes I do. There's many days that I do nothing. Yeah. But and the days that I do, I'll work 22 hours a day nonstop, like an animal. And you kind of have to listen to your body because if, if I'll never force myself. If for some reason, my body's telling me, no, today we're watching TV. We need to watch documentaries. We need to just relax. Mm -hmm. I'll listen. Yeah. Because when I do listen and I rest the next morning, I'm on fire. And it's like, yeah. do, 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 do. I finished what I could do in three days in, in one day. So being very sensitive to your emotions, who do you hang out with? Your, the, the people you surround yourself with are heavily going to affect. Most artists are pretty empathetic creatures, very sensitive people. And so you have to be careful about who you bring into your world who you share your bed with who you know all these things will influence the gestation of your art mm -hmm. and so being very disciplined is important and also part of being disciplined is knowing when to throw it out the window and do anything else you want right but that's part of the discipline yeah. how do you collaborate with other people with other artists maybe I understand that you must collaborate because you create an events and the films, it's natural, but maybe you have something special, uh, you know, you know, something, what would you like to share? I, I treat my collaborative efforts much like a military structure. Mm -hmm. I've tried many other ways. I've tried collaborations and, and sometimes it's a rare occurrence where you just have this chemistry with someone where the collaboration just happens effortlessly and it's magic and you can't explain that it just happens but it's very rare when you're coming on productions movies or you know high profile events and things like that you're gonna have to collaborate with a lot of people that you might not even know you don't know how good they are what they do and so 
quickly creating a level of assertion, you have to you have to study about leadership. This is where the business stuff comes in, mm -hmm. because when it comes into collaboration, most people don't take artists very serious when it comes to leadership or business. Exactly. And so you got to cut your teeth on what it means to be a leader. I read books like a uh, crazy man, mm -hmm. business books, leadership books, how to lead organizations. I'll lead, read a lot of books about military organizations, Napoleon, how he ran his things, Hitler. I mean, there's a lot of garbage in that, but there's beauty in like structure. And I don't want soldiers behaving like generals when they're soldiers like there's a hierarchy and so when everybody knows what they're doing and there's a clear directive it gets done and it gets done effortlessly and well when you start getting to the collaborative process and too many people have opinions and there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen changing the soup putting one salt one pepper then it doesn't work then you have just a gross mess and then everybody's pointing fingers why it tasted bad so my objective is I try not to collaborate if I don't have to. I like to do things my way, which means I have my team that I trust and mm -hmm. we already have our system. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes to me and they say, hey, can you jump on with this other production company? Usually I say no, mm -hmm. unless I really like what they're doing. And then we get very clear about this is my lane, this is your lane, and this is where they meet. But I don't look for collaborations because um, why? Have you ever had a critic to your art? I mean, about your art? Like, it's not essential, it's something not important, not interesting, it's weird, it's crazy. I've had many. Um, I'll start with my parents. Oh, yes. Uh huh. They don't the, understand. The bigger critics, yeah. It's your parents. Most of, I mean, they always supported, like, look, if that's what you want to do. They looked at it more as like, you know, we have a son who has Tourette syndrome and so he's kind of, he's, he's on the fringe of society. And so we're not going to expect a whole lot from him. So they gave me the space to go on. So, so do what makes you happy. <laughs> Only... <laughs> when they started seeing me finding success in it, they started to admit, okay, you know what? Honestly, we don't understand it, but we now respect it because we clearly see that people are buying it and, and it's growing. So maybe we just don't get it. So one of my things is I don't get really excited about sharing my art with my folks mm -hmm. and we're a very close family, but just on that note, it's not very inspiring because I know it, ne it never lands. I had an ex-girlfriend who hated my art. I don't know if she really hated it or if that was her way of trying to gain some level of control, but she wouldn't let me have any of the art in the house. Every time I'd make a sculpture, in the garage, painting in the garage. And, and, and so it was like this control thing that uh -huh. she, and then she would hang things that I'm like, you bought this at fucking world market. Like, what is this? And so I've had, I've had to deal with the, the critique part of it, but I also started my career as an actor and working as an actor, you get a lot of rejection. Mm -hmm. And when you're a, a boy, you're right now seeing beard, tattoos, you know, a guy who's already kind of knows himself. But imagine, uh, let me show you. Okay. Imagine this kid. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> right, with, with Tourette syndrome, who's always twitching and and not quite fitting in the group. I was always very romantic and passionate, and I always loved women. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do very well with them growing up because I was the weird kid. And people don't want to hang out with the weird kid. So I felt constantly rejected, but instead of getting depressed about it, I wanted to figure out how do people think? How do I change this 
structure so that I'm no longer the one that doesn't fit, but I'm the one that is the fit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and from years of just watching people and watching, that's how I got into the studies of psychology and hypnosis was trying to understand why people don't like me. Mm -hmm. And then once you understand how the brain works, it's not that hard to start twisting how the brain works. Mm -hmm. So, so back to your question of critics, fuck them, who cares? Yeah. That it wasn't made for them anyways, because when enough people love what you do, the critics only look stupid later. And most of the times they're quiet because once you start making a real living from what you're doing, People don't, they, they want to be a part of that. They want to be a part of, yeah, I think it's brilliant because people are buying it, right? It's, you usually find critics when nobody's buying. So, mm -hmm. so they, they yeah. want to come up with that. So your answer could be advice to people who is afraid of, you know, of critics and who is afraid to create something. Why are they afraid of the critics? Let's pretend you're somebody who's afraid of critics. And I asked you, why are you afraid of critics? What would you say? Uh, how to say, right? Like from our childhood, when when we we always wanted to be good girl, good boy, you know, or, or something like this. With we always need a social um, approval. Yes, approve that that word. So maybe okay, that, but... but when you grew up and when you are like uh, you have your person you grew up your personality and you grew up like a person i think it's it's not it's not so important what people think about you and if you have you know like your value and you have your position strong position so i think it's not important that critic this critic don't get me wrong it is very important. Your reputation is very important. Mm -hmm. And it's an act when we say, well, we don't care what people think. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it looks good to say that. But we have to care what people think. And we have to be very smart about positioning ourselves in a way where people think of us in a manner that we intend them to now sometimes it's provocative sometimes you want them to think oh it's a bad guy or a bad girl or yeah. edgy or whatever. but it's controlled you don't just do whatever and you don't care what they think because if you do that for long enough nobody's going to give a shit about you yeah maybe. it's a it's a very calculated maneuver of not giving a fuck what people think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's why I say art is, you know, it's really important, but psychology and business is first in order to make it an art. Unless, you know, I mean, there are some flukes that happen, but, but for the majority of people who are watching this, they have probably some craft that they're working on and they want to build it. And art is not necessary. And usually people who buy art Again, either it's a wealthy artist who wants to support other artists, but most of the time it's somebody looking to spend money and find a way where either that money is going to grow or it's a tax incentive or like there's all kinds of reasons why people buy art. I would advise the artist to learn what all of those are and figure out a way to put your art in a place where somebody goes, oh, that makes sense for me to throw that money there, yeah. right? Tie your art to a charity, Tie, do something where, you know, there's an incentive because most of the time people don't even know if it's good. <laughs> I can tell you a good half of my clients uh -huh. don't even know if my events are good. They pay me, they don't know if it's good, but they see all their friends love it. So they keep bringing me. Yeah. But they don't have the taste because they're not artists. They're like, you know, finance people or whatever. They have no clue about what's cool. Mm -hmm. They wear the weirdest clothes, you know, like bright orange shoes and sh cargo shorts and no style. Like a lot of times these people who buy the art have no sensitivity for art. Uh -huh. They're doing it because they want to fit in. And so they see, oh, that looks cool. People love it. So I'll buy it. Right. You have to understand all those dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, where are you? <laughs> yes, you are here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I so love this your uh, position because some sometimes people think that to be an artist and to create an art is just like to to fly every time and like to be a very free soul and like to be you know like free and they don't think that to to create art and to to make money with your art must you must like to 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 have all these skills and all these tools what you said about so yeah well you you're right um art is about being free and flighty and all that but not when you yeah. when you're creating the art yeah and you have to you have to know like you put on a hat it's like now it's time for creation i'm a child now now i'm just playing i'll eat crayons i'll put paint on my head i'll put the paint on the canvas whatever yeah. you do whatever you want yeah but then when you take a shower and you put on your clothes and it's time to sell it you're a different person now yes exactly so that i meant that people all this uh, people often just see the one part of art like of creating something very interesting word freedom and so on but they don't they don't think about another part and maybe they shouldn't think about it like you know why they should Have you your favorite artist? Yeah, I a fav I mean, I have a few. One of them is H.R. Giger. And um, he has an amazing museum. I'll send you some links of his work yeah, okay. and a documentary on Netflix called A Dark Star. Mm -hmm. Very inspiring to me. Salvador Dali is one of my favorites, yeah. but I have artists in many spheres filmmakers actors like my again my art is not just events i started as an actor moved to events then direct films i play drums so i'm inspired by so many different things i'm inspired by watching how crickets rub their legs and make a sound you know there's i'm inspired by everything uh -huh. okay um i don't em emulate any artist when I say I'm inspired by it, I love their commitment to whatever they did, but I don't try to be anything like anybody. I try very hard. I try hard and it's also effortless. It depends on what day you catch me to maintain my signature. Yeah. Right. And that means not to be influenced by a client, not to be influenced by somebody, you know, who's watching you in the middle of the work and goes, Eh, you know, I think that could be, but shut the fuck up. I'm not even finished. Like, but that could influence your, yeah. your whole mood. So I make it a point to have nobody around when I'm creating. I want perfect silence, quiet, so that whatever's coming through is coming through. And only when it's ready, I share it. I don't share a damn thing until I feel like it's ready. And when it's ready, I don't usually hear anybody saying anything, okay. cr you know, critiques on uh -huh, it that uh -huh. I don't Okay. And do you have your favorite work? Be crudely, I view my work like um, going to the bathroom. The, the finished product, that's already after. So for my, you know, my art process is cooking the food, smelling it, eating it, enjoying it. That's the journey. Mm -hmm. Once it leaves my body, that's what somebody buys. I don't think about it anymore. I flush it down the toilet and tomorrow we're doing it all again. So I'm not precious about my art. I used to be, mm -hmm. but I had one of my biggest projects was like a boutique hotel. Yeah. And I spent all my savings and all my energy into it. And then it got burnt down. Oh. And so that was a very hard lesson to let go. And I started looking at my art, like drawing on the sand and the beach, and then the waves come and wash it away. So, you know, I saw your upcoming event, yeah? And maybe you could tell me more about this event, no? <laughs> Until the events happen, nobody knows anything. Yes, I understand. Okay, so <laughs> forget this question. So a little bit about your movies, about your films. How many films you have created? 
So I did a short film uh -huh. two years ago, and I did it just for fun, just yeah. to see if I could do it. Uh -huh. And I told it from the perspective of synesthesia, so mm -hmm. there's no dialogue. The whole movie is, it's called Ego. And so it's my struggles with ego and the egos around me, but told through the version of how I experience life without words. And in the first 30 days, it won 18 awards. And so from that, I was like, okay, maybe there's something here. I got a call from somebody in Australia who had a film and offered to finance a film. I would direct it and build the sets and wardrobe. I didn't know if it was real. So I said, okay, Mr. Australia, mm -hmm. if you're serious, come to LA. This is the area I live in, get a house here and let's meet. Two days later, he was in LA. We had one dinner, signed contracts, finished our first feature. <laughs> so now we're at the end of editing that. And before I even finished editing that, I had another idea for a film. I went back to them and they financed the second. So uh -huh. I have two years in a short under my belt in the last one year. Fear is the worst thing in, in art. If uh -huh. there's one thing I can tell anybody here is conquer your fears. If you're afraid of something, go do it. You're afraid of jumping from a plane, jump from the plane. <laughs> you're sharks, go swim with the sharks. So you know you're not afraid of things. And if you are afraid of it, you're willing to stand up for it. Yeah. And then eventually you start learning, you know what? I'm not really afraid of anything because anything I was afraid of, it wasn't that bad. 